Hey there, everybody. It's Mike Felicio with another Solo Mode review. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at Parks from designer Henry Audubon and publisher Keymaster Games. In Parks, you are playing as a hiker, visiting different national parks, and in the solo game, you're going to be sharing some trail space with park rangers. And so, why don't we head on over to the table? I'll give you a quick overview of how the game changes in the solo game, any different components and rules changes. And then we're going to come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts on the solo mode. So let's head on over to the table. Okay, here we see a game of parks set up for the solo game. As far as component changes, there are just a couple. The main things I want to highlight is that you are going to start off as a color. You're going to have your normal two hikers. In this case, let's say I'm playing purple. You're going to choose another color for the rangers who you're going to be kind of sharing the park path with. And in this case, I went with the white tokens for them. You're going to start with the first player marker. You're going to start with the camera. You're going to start with your fire, uh, campfire, kind of like uh, normal you'd have that, but these two start with you as well. The main difference is, is going to be that you're going to make sure that the trail end is going to have the solo side. And you'll see here at the bottom it says solo. Normally you would have this as your trail end. Solo game, you make sure that it's set to the solo side. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to have this deck of event cards and the ranger tracker card, which is actually part of that. That's the only difference as far as components go in the solo game. The correct side of the trail end, this event deck, and the ranger tracker card. The last thing to cover is that normally you would have three gear cards out there on display. In the solo game, you do not. You have the gear deck there, but you do not seed the board with those first three and the reason why will be seen here in a moment. All right, so let's talk about the gameplay changes. So for the player, your gameplay doesn't really change at all. You're going to move to any of the spots that you uh, would like to on the first turn because you have nobody blocking you. If you had somebody blocking you, either yourself or a ranger, you'd have to flip over your campfire token. <clears throat> Pardon me, just like normal. And so, let's say I went here and I took this ocean uh, spot, I took this sun that's there, and the two water that correspond to that spot. All of that is just as per normal. Now what's going to happen is the ranger is going to take their turn. So what you do is you flip over the top card of the gear deck and you look at the number of suns in the upper right, which is also the cost of the gear card. Normally, as in the multiplayer game, you're only going to be paying attention to that for the cost. Well, in the solo game, what you're going to do is use that for movement. The one cost cards are going to go here, the two cost cards are going to go here, and the three cost cards are going to go here. And so in this case, when both rangers are at the trailhead, it doesn't matter which one you move, you're going to move it that number of spaces. So in this case, three. One, two, three. Well, they're not going to stop on the same place as you. They'll go to the next one. So the ranger is going to go there. They're going to take this water and they're going to place it on their water tracker. Okay. So this ranger tracker card has, as you can see here, a spot for three suns and a spot for three waters. As they collect the, actually, sorry, this should have been seated here. So you can see what uh, event you're dealing with. And in this case, it was dense fog. All right. And so you place it next to it so that you can kind of see what's coming. In this case, if they fill up all three of their waters by collecting them from, from the uh, row here, you're going to have to discard all of the water that you have. If, you, if they collect all three of the suns, now the next event card is going to be face down until it's activated, so you don't know what bad thing is going to happen. Normally, like here, you can see what's going to happen when one of these triggers, and you can maybe kind of account for it and mitigate for it. In the dense fog case, you cannot do so. You just have to know something bad is going to happen. You'll continue to take your turns. The rangers will continue to take their turns. In this case, it would be a one. So uh, let's say I had moved here. As long as one of the rangers is ahead of yours, then the one in the back is going to go. So in this case, they would move forward one. All right. What changes when they get towards the end is, let's say that I had moved here. Um, and now there's someone ahead of the ranger, so the front one is going to go. He's going to flip over a card. It's a one. 
he could go here. Let's say, for example, though, that he had gotten another three. I'm going to try to find really quickly. There we go. Let's say instead, at this point, he had pulled that three card. Now, one, two, now he's going to the trail end. And so what you're going to do is you're going to look at the spots here. And depending on which card gets them to the trail end is going to be where they go on these three spaces. In this case, it was a three. So what he's going to do, he would go here. He would remove the rightmost park. So this card would be gone. Now, I would not have access to that. It would not refill right away. And then all of the three um, sun cards would get shuffled back into the gear deck. If a one sun card gets a ranger to that spot, they will remove the leftmost park, and then the ranger will move over to here. And so if you had not already gone there, they would take the first player. If you had already gone there, they would block that reserve uh, park spot, and you could not go there with your second one. If you went, the ranger went there with the two sun, they would remove the second, or the center, as they say here, the middle uh, park card, and then you would have to return the camera back to the supply. So that's really how that happens. Those are the major rules differences, is just that you use the gear cards for movement. Depending on which gear card gets them into the trail end, you're going to take the appropriate um, actions there. The ranger tracker is going to fill up, and more and more events are going to happen, none of which are potentially uh, things that you want. Move your back hiker to the closest ranger, discard one of your gear, move your back hiker to your front hiker, discard down to four resources. Rangers immediately move again, discard all of your sons. So you can get the idea here. These are, none of these are things that you want to happen. They're all things that, that cause you to kind of uh, get in the way of you fulfilling what you want to do. At the end of the game, you add up all of your points as normal, and you're going to get a ranking here based off of what it says in the book uh, with, with a matrix between uh, less than 20, 20 to 24, and 25 to 29. All right. So there you go. That's the difference in components and rules. Let's head back over and take a look at my final thoughts. Okay, hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea on how the solo game of Parks differs from the multiplayer game, the small component changes and rules changes. Now I'd like to give you my overall impressions of the game. First of all, the solo experience. There are three main things I like to look at uh, when we talk about this in a solo game. The first is win conditions. Uh, does it have a clear win-loss condition? Are you playing against an automated opponent, or is it a beat-your-high-score variant? Well, uh, Parks, unfortunately, in my mind, does go the score-high-score score variant. And uh, normally, this is something that causes me quite a bit of consternation. Some games are more suited for a virtual opponent than others. And honestly, in Parks, this is one of the rare occasions where the high score variant doesn't bother me too much. And it's strictly because of thematic reasons. Parks is a game where it wouldn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense to be competitively trying to see more parks. Now, in the regular game, that's essentially what you're doing. You're trying to visit more parks than the other players. But there's not a real cutthroat feel to the game, even in the multiplayer game. The main thing is that you could potentially be blocking other players from going places that you might want to go. You might be visiting parks that they may, look, may be looking to visit. And so it would not have been completely out of the realm to have a solo opponent in the game where you are trying to do what you are in the multiplayer game. That being said, it doesn't bother me very much that in the solo game, you are kind of sharing space along with the park rangers and you're really focusing more on trying to maximize your experience. Could they have done a solo opponent? They certainly could, and it may have actually led to a stronger solo experience, but I'm cutting a little bit of the score based on this, but not as much as I might have in another type of game. Setup and teardown is another thing I like to look at. And in parks, the setup and teardown is fine. It's a relatively short game. You're talking about less than an hour for the solo game, and the setup is pretty quick. I mean, you, especially once you've played the game a few times, you can set it up in five minutes. It's not a heavy time commitment to set this game, but to take it off your shelf, to get playing it, you're playing it within a few minutes. And so the, the setup and teardown is, is great, especially for a game of this weight, this time period. If, uh, if it was much longer of a setup, it probably would have been a negative. In this case, it's perfectly fine. 
Rules are another thing I like to look at in a solo game. And the rules for uh, parks, both multiplayer and solo, are pretty clear. Um, the solo section is at the end. They didn't try to integrate it into the main rule book. I do appreciate that. I think it can be really challenging when they kind of stick it all together and you have to parse out which is uh, applicable for the solo game or not. So a clear spot in the book for the solo rules and they are relatively clear. The only thing that might cause a little bit of confusion is kind of when the end of trail actions take place. Uh, the, the rangers, how they handle their end of trail, that can be a little bit confusing, but I found it to be relatively intuitive. I didn't have a tremendous amount of problems with it. Uh, so overall, I think the rules were a positive. Okay, so overall, what do I think of Parks as a solo game? Uh, I think it is relatively uh, close to the multiplayer game in the level of charm that it exudes. And that's the thing that I probably appreciate about this game most, is that the theme really comes through. It's a game where you don't feel this pressure at all. Um, and, and for some that might be a negative, but for this game, to me, it's not. You're, you're really trying to have a pleasant experience. You're traveling along the trail. You're collecting resources. You're getting gear. You're taking photos. You're visiting parks. Um, you know, you do have these events that come up in the solo game, and, and those events can sometimes cause a little bit of tension, uh, tension a little bit of angst. But generally speaking, this is a game of enjoying the journey, trying to get the most out of this journey. And I think that the solo game captures that quite well. I think that most of the things that I really like in the multiplayer game are still there in the solo game. You still have all of the main mechanisms in play. Uh, there's really very little difference other than you have just those rangers that you are having to account for and those events that come up. So, the positives that I found in the main game, the art, the components, the, uh, the mechanisms. I really like the moving forward on a track, not being able to go back. You can go as far as you want, but you're passing up those other spots. All of those things I still find charming in the solo game of Parks. I take off a little bit because you have the high score variant, and uh, that's never my preferred method of a uh, solo game. It's also relatively light. There's not a whole lot of decisions to make, but uh, the ones that you do have to make uh, are, are satisfying. And so with all of that being said, I think of Parks as a, a very good solo game above average, and that's why I'm rating it a 7 out of 10. It's a game that uh, I think has some legs, probably not the, a game you're going to come back to 30, 40 times as a solo gamer, but your, mile, your mileage may vary on that. If you particularly like the theme, it might be one that comes back uh, more often than not. All right, well, thank you very much for your time as always, and have a great day.